People in the southern United States are quite familiar with large reptiles. The American alligator ranges all the way up to eastern North Carolina and southeast Oklahoma. But lurking in the shadows of southern Florida is a relative newcomer. Since the early 2000s, invasive Burmese pythons have become firmly established here. Because they've had devastating impacts on the ecosystem, wildlife experts have tried a wide range of tactics to control the spread of Burmese pythons, with varying success. As of now, it appears the pythons will not be removed from peninsular Florida. For this reason, ecologists have had to ask a difficult question. How far north will the pythons spread? And one answer to that question, put forth by the U.S. Geological Service in 2008, had frightening implications. This climate modeling study predicted that pythons could spread all the way north to places like Maryland or Tennessee. This map was widely spread by news outlets, and it became a critical part of invasive species discussions. But the map has a critical flaw. It ignores one unique aspect of climate in the Deep South, a factor which will make or break the success of an invasive species here. But before we dive into that, we should first consider what a Burmese python actually is. It's one of two closely related species from South and Southeast Asia. Its close relative, the Indian python, is a wide-ranging generalist, inhabiting the tar desert of the Northwest in India, as well as deep rainforest, and everything in between. The Burmese python is more of a forest specialist, limited to the more humid East. It has a strong preference for swampy lowlands, where it uses the water's edge to ambush prey. Where their ranges overlap, these two species produce fertile offspring. And, in fact, many of the invasive pythons in Florida have ancestry from both species. For that reason, it's probably important to consider the biology of both species when predicting their invasive potential. With warm, swampy lowlands stretching to the horizon across much of Florida, it's easy to see why the Burmese python has found a niche here. But the climate of the American Deep South has a devilish trick to play on invasive species, one that this map overlooks. To create this map, the USGS looked at the average temperatures of the python's home range and compared it to those of the southern USA. Sounds reasonable, right? Well, there's a problem with that. Orlando, Florida, and New Delhi, India, are at roughly the same latitude and their average winter temperatures are pretty similar, but the all-time record low temperature in New Delhi is barely a light frost, about 0 degrees Celsius or 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Orlando, Florida has seen temperatures that low almost every year, and its record low is minus 8 degrees Celsius or 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Although both locations have similar average temperatures, one of them is far more vulnerable to extremes. This only becomes increasingly true in the rest of the South. Compare Alexandria, Louisiana, and Lahore, Pakistan. Again, the averages aren't very different, but the all-time record low in Lahore is about minus 2 degrees Celsius or 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Alexandria, Louisiana has seen temperatures at least that low every single year since 1893 and it usually gets way colder. It's gotten below minus 10 degrees Celsius seven times in the last hundred years. So why is the Deep South so much more vulnerable to extreme cold? What protects lowland India, Pakistan, and Myanmar from the same conditions? Well, it's these, mountain ranges. Mountains surround the Indian subcontinent like a castle wall, standing between the cold air masses of Siberia and the milder south. If any continental polar air mass from Siberia crosses these mountains, it will be warmed dramatically by the Foehn effect. I've mentioned this in previous videos, but it's often forgotten just how strong the Foehn effect is. On the Canadian prairie, Foehn winds crossing the Rockies can raise January temperatures from minus 20 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius in a matter of hours. And the Himalayas are far higher than the Canadian Rockies. Meanwhile, 
Continental polar air masses from the Canadian Arctic can sweep down to the southeast U.S. without crossing any mountain barrier or body of water. As a result, this region has deceptively warm average temperatures relative to its extremes. This major difference has many ramifications. Groves of mango are productive and economical north of Jhelum in Pakistan. At the same latitude in southern Arkansas, that's completely unfeasible. In fact, the U.S. Department of Agriculture doesn't recommend planting mango trees outside southern Florida. Mild winters on the Indian subcontinent also support a wide range of large reptiles. Mugger crocodiles and gharials both ranged up to the Punjab in recent history before they were overhunted, much farther north than the American crocodile in Florida. In the foothills of Kashmir, Indian pythons are prolific enough to cause problems for shepherds and goat herds. All across the plains and foothills of northern India and Pakistan, you can find species normally associated with the tropics because mountains protect the region from extreme cold. On the opposite side of the world, parts of Argentina have a climate similar to the southern U.S. But Argentina isn't vulnerable to continental polar air masses either. The cold air from the Southern Ocean can't compare. As a result, boa constrictors are found at 33 degrees south in Argentina. In short, continental polar air masses have a huge influence on biogeography. Another factor that helps South Asian reptiles is the winter dry season. The coldest time of year is also the driest. And those dry, sunny days allow reptiles to bask warming their core temperatures so they can be active. Southern Florida has a similar climate with a noticeable winter dry season, but the rest of the South does not. Across most of the Gulf states, winter is actually the rainiest and cloudiest time of year. And already, we've seen these climatic factors causing serious harm to invasive pythons. During the deep freeze of 2010, many of Florida's pythons were killed outright, especially females. In the years following that apocalyptic prediction from the USGS, a number of follow-up studies have contradicted its findings. All of them have essentially stated what I have here, that the southeast U.S. has deceptively warm average temperatures but is uniquely vulnerable to a sudden deep freeze. And you might be thinking, won't climate change help pythons spread north? Well, it's not that simple. There is a lot of good evidence to suggest that climate change could actually make cold air outbreaks worse. If that's true, a slight increase in average temperature won't be much help to tropical species. Again, the average temperatures aren't the limiting factor here. But are cold snaps really enough to stop the spread of pythons? Could they adapt in some way or another? Well. The southern U.S. does have some very successful invaders from milder climates, and they all have one thing in common. They use the insulation of the earth to survive temperature extremes. Fire ants are an excellent example of this. They were brought accidentally from northern Argentina to Mobile, Alabama in the 1930s, and they rapidly spread across the southeast, surviving deep freezes below ground. Though it was once assumed that they would stay in the deep south, Fire ants have now spread into the Appalachians of Tennessee. Nine-banded armadillos are a similar story, but an even more dramatic one. Before the 1800s, they were only found south of the Rio Grande. By now, they've spread up to the plains of Nebraska. Armadillos don't have much natural insulation on their body, but they use the earth to make up for it. And many of our native species use the same strategy. One of the largest snake species in North America, the bull snake, actually ranges up into the dry plains of central Canada. Bull snakes use the leftover burrows made by prairie dogs to survive the winter, often after eating them. Another example is the eastern indigo snake in the Deep South. They were the largest snake species in the Deep South before the pythons. To shelter from the winter's cold, indigo snakes use burrows made by gopher tortoises. Do invasive pythons also seek refuge in burrows to escape the cold? Well, in the case of the Burmese python, sort of. They will seek some type of shelter in cooler weather, but deep earthen burrows aren't something they evolved to seek out. 
Indian pythons in the tar desert, on the other hand, do use the burrows of a prolific digging animal, the Indian crested porcupine. These porcupines actually range all the way west to the Aegean, digging large dens in the desert soil wherever they go. But the range of the Indian python doesn't match that of this porcupine. There are plenty of big, roomy porcupine dens they could move into in Central Asia, but pythons are still confined to the warmth of the Indian subcontinent. Could invasive pythons use the burrows of gopher tortoise, like our native snakes do? Certainly. Gopher tortoise burrows average 15 feet in length and can reach 40 feet, or 12 meters, a roomy space even for a python. But even the gopher tortoise itself only ranges up to the South Carolina border. Wide burrows like this provide some protection, but they're drafty holes, not airtight, heated rooms. Just as porcupine dens don't save Indian pythons from the most severe cold, gopher tortoise burrows aren't perfect protection for invasive pythons either. Okay, so climate will clearly be an obstacle in the immediate future. But what about genetic adaptation? Certainly those cold snaps will cause some natural selection in Florida pythons, right? To some degree, that is likely. And the process has probably already begun. In the deep freeze of 2010 that killed so many of Florida's pythons, there was some variability in how the snakes responded to the cold. Many of them attempted to bask in the sunshine, a critical mistake. Basking works well in cool weather, but not in truly frigid conditions. Cold-adapted reptiles instinctively give up on the sunshine when temperatures drop too low, and instead seek refuge in the earth or in water. This is a critical difference between the American alligator and crocodiles or caimans. All of them will bask in cool weather, but crocodiles and caimans keep trying to bask even when temperatures drop too low for basking to be effective. Alligators, on the other hand, somehow instinctively recognize that threshold. They stop basking and slip into the deepest part of the swamp, even if it has a thin layer of ice. Most other reptiles use dens or burrows, but the principle is the same. And interestingly enough, some pythons in Florida did respond appropriately and retreated to underground refuges. In a 2010 survey, those individuals had far higher survival rates than their brethren. And if that instinct is heritable, it might be passed down to future generations of pythons in Florida. But that instinct isn't the only adaptation our native reptiles have to the cold. They also have internal physiological adaptations. And according to one study, the 2010 cold snap may have selected for similar adaptations in Florida's pythons. The cold snap seemed to select for genes associated with thermosensation, for example. In other words, each cold snap in the south might be selecting for more cold-resistant pythons, those whose behavior and internal physiology is a better match for the new environment. Evolution could certainly influence the future of Florida's pythons, but to what extent? It's difficult to say. Herpetologists remain skeptical about the dire predictions of the 2008 study done by the USGS. As of now, it seems unlikely that Tennessee will have to worry about pythons swimming up the Mississippi. Although pythons have caused widespread damage to Florida's ecosystem, ecologists will probably have a lot to learn from this accidental experiment. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.